in American history. Because remember, Pearl Harbor is at the front end of the war, and the Indianapolis is really the back bookend. They don't know it at the time that they're the back bookend. They don't know that the war will end in August, in September of 1945, but these guys play a, a, a key role in that. So interesting. And so what do you think is the, what are the, what are the larger implications of the story of, of the Indianapolis to the American voter? Um, you know, because I think there's, it's almost a metaphor of so many other unintended consequences of warfare and particularly sort of the, the machismo and, and gravitas that's involved when, you know, we're trying to fight a war. I mean, the fact that it delivered the atomic bomb, arguably the most lethal and harmful possible conceivable mm -hmm. punch a country could deliver, and then is sunk. Uh, and then on top of that, the captain committing suicide, being court-martialed by his own uh, country, uh, I mean, there's just so many unintended consequences here that I feel offer a uh, a lesson for us to to learn about warfare. And so, in your reporting and in your writing, I'm curious: can you tell us how do you interpret these events uh, for the American voter? You say the American voter? Yes. Yeah. As opposed to like, what do you mean by the American voter? Just the the person who's kind of civically involved or engaged in. I guess I should say the American citizen, because let's face it, part of the reason we get mired in some of these in, in some of these oh, conflicts right. is because a lot of the uh, American citizenry is not participating when it comes to matters of national security. Really? Uh, so I think I should expand it from just the yeah. voter to the American citizen. Well, no, I, I well, no, it's 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 totally apt because when this ship sinks, okay, so it's July thirtieth, nineteen forty five. There's one thousand one hundred ninety six basically young men gus k from chicago is 16. okay captain mcveigh who will later be court-martialed uh, and who gets off the ship is 48. um 900 go into the water about 300 an estimate are killed instantly they're dumped into the water and when they're finally rescued five days later by pure miracle to kind of jump to your to your question, America is involved. The reason McVeigh is corporate is because America is completely engaged in World War II in a national narrative. And the answer, the question is, how could this happen? How could a ship be sunk? How could so many people die, almost 800, well, 880, so close to the war's end? Congress is involved, it's the headline of the day, and therefore, um, the U.S. government brings Commander Hashimoto, the combatant who sunk the ship to testify against Captain Charles McVeigh in a courtroom in Washington, D.C., as a government witness. And Hashimoto himself says there's nothing that this captain could have done to avoid me sinking him. You'll have to read the book to get into the more technical parts of it, but McVeigh was not basically tacking across the ocean in a defensive maneuver um, for a number of reasons, um, but that's why he was court-martialed. Um, so McVeigh's sense of leadership, iron-spined kind of, it's my responsibility, even though there's likely nothing I could have done kind of technically or literally to avoid the sinking. Um, he, he, he ends up committing suicide. So, America is engaged in the in the narrative, and I think what I mean. There's some deeper issues to this story, which I'd love to get into during the conversation today. But I just want to jump ahead to say, while all this happened, headlines of the day: the young men, the 316 who do survive, um, come home after the war's end, after the celebrations, the ticker tape parades. And they come home very much and reminiscent of an experience that our Vietnam veterans will, will have years later, which is no one's really paying attention anymore. The war's over, the captain is court-martialed, the ship's sunk. Um, they're, they're living a bit, they're living under a cloud actually, which is propelling them eventually to campaign to clear his name, which they succeed at. So having said that, they come home, um, my friend and now deceased Richard Thalen from Lansing, Michigan was married 
when married to his first wife, did not tell her for the six, first six or seven years of their marriage that it actually served on the ship. Just think that, let that sink in for a moment. Um, the most traumatic thing that's probably ever happened to Dick, he does not disclose. So while the country is completely engaged in the war and we understand that the narrative of how World War II ends, these guys are uh, hiding or covering this trauma. And finally, when I, and, they, and <laughs> to jump to the 70s, I think it's the 70s, when the movie Jaws comes out, this is the third thing about how people may know about the Indianapolis besides the bomb and the court martial. The movie Jaws comes out and there's a famous scene people might remember of Robert Shaw as Captain Quint. Remember with Richard Dreyfuss, he gives a famous monologue. He's a fictional survivor of the ship. So Quint ostensibly is on board and and this is, you know, it's one of the best moments in the movie. And this is how really uh, it reemerges back into the American consciousness. Now, I mentioned uh, there's Bob McGuigan, now deceased, and Mike Carrilla from Chicago. They actually call each other, or the, one of them is home, and their kids are saying, hey, Dad, I see this movie's out. Jaws, weren't you on the Indianapolis? Ah, I, don't, I don't want to talk about it. So Bob and Mike call each other up, and they actually sneak off to the movie and watch it together. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's probably a, a terrifying experience for both of them. You know, the men, when they emerge from this, um, many of them don't want to go into swimming pools. They don't want to take a bath in a bathtub. They don't like uh, Eugene Morgan from Seattle, Washington, when I was on book tour. And sadly, I keep saying this, but Eugene is now deceased. He, we were having lunch in Seattle. I said, see that bridge over there? And I said, yeah, he goes, I don't like to drive over it because of the water issue. So one of the things we can do as storytellers is kind of help unpack these stories so that that we shy, you know, they, they are able to breathe. And I think that's what the book did successfully. And which is why we're still talking about it 20 years later is I, I just focused on not the court martial and not the sharks so much because the sharks do get overplayed in the story a bit. Um, although they were there, but just on the human drama of the, the, the psychic journey of the men. So when you saw that, uh, Microsoft co-founder, Paul Allen, uh, who is, uh, had a, an, another life, if you will, in discovering, uh, sunken artifacts, when you saw that he had discovered the Indianapolis, what was going on in your heart and head? Uh, I'm curious the emotions you well, experienced and, and what you sure. think those survivors experienced. Yeah, that August 19th, 2017, um, Paul Allen and a crew finally do find this ship in 18,000 feet plus water, um, pres preserved in a pristine condition because of the depth and the, the, the water temperature. Um, for me, my relationship with the story has been... In 1999, 124 survivors were alive. Today, there are two in 2022. So um, it was, uh, uh, you know, 20 years of kind of just being in touch and, and, and et cetera. And I remember on that day in 2017 talking, I was in a hotel room uh, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan with um, Richard Thalen. Again, we just talked about a survivor. And we were on a PBS documentary, um, which eventually came out about the discovery of the ship. And for d someone like Dick, it, it, it actually, to be able to visualize the ship resting on the bottom of the ocean, to have it, to come to the understanding that it still existed in the world. Because remember, we're 17, 18, 19, it's the middle of the night, the ship is hit, it blows up and turns into an inferno, sinks in 12 minutes goes down and everything we own, our wallet, our photographs, letters, our paychecks, goes down with the ship. We float for five days in a void and are rescued by miracle. And then the war is over and we scatter back across the country. We don't have camaraderie like you might have, Rajiv, with some of your buddies from the army. We don't, there's no chance, there's no, there's no end to the story. And to see that, you know, the ship sails to the bottom of the ocean, boom, hits. 
And to see it landing there, I think, well, I know for Dick, it, it allowed him to think that's, that's kind of where the story ends or that, or that's where the story is. It's considered a grave site. It's not been touched or explored except to have been discovered and its location is not exactly known. Um, but that's, you know, that's what it meant. Uh, again, it goes back to the idea of putting a period on the end of the sentence. You know, what happened to you? which I think is what the book asks. No kidding. I tell you, the, the, the storytelling you do in this, in this book, I mean, it, it literally brought me to tears um, thinking about what those uh, very young men had to go through in the middle of uh, the Pacific Ocean, just completely stranded. And let's talk a little bit about why they were stranded for so long. Uh, it, it took, I believe, four days uh, before anyone decided to go send uh, send someone to look for these folks. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the circumstances? Why the secrecy around this ship? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's in, uh, this is the befuddling uh, part. The secrecy, of course, would be leaving San Francisco or Mare Island with their secret cargo and then delivering it, the, the, you know, traveling at top speed. They set a record, actually, to Honolulu, uh, speed record. Um, but then they continue. Then they continue on to the Philippines after that delivery in more relaxed conditions. Um, the war is, the tempo is, is, is both I think slack and also it's it's gearing up to become much more brisk as we think about Japan and and further combat. So by that I mean when they leave their place of uh, departure, they're taken off plotting boards. So this is before a compute, you know, computers, as we know them. So they, you know, the guy takes that, you know, Indianapolis. We're no longer, no longer our problem. They're gone. Where they're going to in the Philippines, they don't when they don't arrive in their berth. Um, the young officer, the naval officer, walks down to the to the harbor and sees it's not there and says, "Well, I'm not supposed to uh, report the arrival of combatant ships." So therefore, I must not report the non-arrival. Wow. Right. So what you might call the fog of war, right? I mean, <laughs> so even though he may know and people around him in the office probably knew, Indianapolis is not here, but it's the flagship of the Fifth Fleet. It, um, it knows what it's doing. I mean, I can only imagine. Um, but that's so it, it sits out there, the men do now, um, floating in pods of life vests and rafts and, and floater nets. Um, thinking that when they're sunk early, early Monday morning, it's like after midnight, Monday morning, um, that, well, normal shipping route, standard route, a known route will be picked up on Tuesday. Right. Um, yeah. It's like, you'd, and when that doesn't happen, then it begins to dawn on <clears throat> some of the, the men floating in the water that they're not missed yet because otherwise... <laughs> They're th about 300 miles approximately offshore of the Philippines. Yeah. Um, Wednesday comes, and now no one has come at all. Thursday comes, and it did, at this point, it dawns on us as readers, or did dawn on me, that um, we're here. This is our reality now, so how do we react to it? And this is, I think, you know, the tearful part of the story, the poignant part of the story, um, because you, you see people react differently to this existential moment, which is really what the book is about. I mean, my, in all three books, my, my goal is to make you forget you're, writing, you're reading about combat or war, because I'm not really focusing on the bombs or the bullets or the destruction, you know, or the, or the violence so much, but about the human heart, as Faulkner would say, kind of in conflict with itself, trying to move through the moment. Um, both in self-preservation and um, et cetera. So when they don't come, Rajiv, um, some of the young men um, begin to swim away from the group. And this is where, <clears throat> when you, you said you were reading the book and you felt, um, I guess sad would be a word. I had the whole timeline of the book you know, taped up on my office wall. Like this is, you know, they get, they sink here and they're rescued here and they come out of the water. And I just couldn't wait to write to the end when the ships finally 
when they are rescued because it was no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader is the old, the old um, adage. And what happens on the fifth day, turns out we don't know, again, that's a Friday, thir Thursday late, uh, uh, um, Chuck Gwynn, whom the guys ended up calling their angel, is flying over on a recon mission um, with some bombs and he sees an oil slick and thinks it's a combatant ship and he's going to attack it in some fashion or at least drop down and check it out and when he does he discovers that it's actually not a combatant ship but these are young men floating in the water covered in fuel oil or bunker oil um, and he has no idea who they are neither does the Pacific Command so the messages whirl around the command and finally oh yeah that ship that didn't arrive that <laughs> that's this is who they belong to and thus the, the the rescue part of the book and the story is just as fascinating it's, it's enormous absolutely we've got some great commentary coming in on our internal chat as well as on our youtube page um we have uh, a gentleman uh chris sean uh also uh, pointing out that uh, one of the biggest killers of the folks in the ocean was uh, drinking salt water. Yeah. You're dehydrated in the, and you're, you need water and uh, you can't drink anything because you can actually die from overconsumption uh, sure. of, of salt water. And so that's a great comment, Chris. Thank you. And then from the YouTube site, we also have uh, Allison Yamamoto. Uh, I think this is a beautiful question. As a descendant of Hiroshima, I'm curious to hear more stories about the impact nuclear war had on the modernization push for Japan to westernize, uh, to become the new Japan we know today. Uh, I think that's a, fan, a, a really interesting uh, discussion point. So the bomb is dropped mm -hmm. and there is now this push for the Japanese to modernize. I'm curious, um, you know, was as you did your research and you're following the evolution of Japan in this conflict, what did you learn? What did you take away from the effects of this bomb? Or bombs, I should say. Well, it's in, I mean, interesting is not the word. It's um, number one, the young men aboard. If you'd said we have a nuclear bomb on board, they, they they didn't know what they were carrying, nor could they probably comprehend from their high schooling what this even was or meant. When they learn about it, their first reaction, I think, is uh, we're not now going to invade Japan. The war is over. In the moment. That's the kind of reaction you have when you're in the foxhole and the shooting stops. Um, often people have asked, was this karmic retribution for dropping the bomb? You know, I mean, somehow did the, the arc of the universe come back and sink the ship? I didn't find that prevalent among the survivors. I think I actually found their reaction to the, the presence of nuclear weapons in our life now is they're, they're, it was mixed. Um, I will tell um, Giles McCoy, one of the survivors and the creator of the USS Indianapolis Survivors Organization, is at Pearl Harbor on the 50th anniversary, and he actually is in greeting um, Commander Hashimoto. And whether apocryphal or not, Giles told me this story is he and um, Hashimoto met there in Pearl Harbor and um, McCoy, they embraced and their wives were talking and he, and he said to, through an interpreter, please tell Mr. Hashimoto, um, um, you know, I forgive you for torpedoing the ship and the, causing the suffering of so many men. And, and, uh, and as McCoy told it, you know, Hashimoto said, forgive me you should know that the bomb you dropped destroyed the lives of thousands and thousands of people and which is which is the, the raw fact of our lives and and there's no resolution to that moment i think what the moment is is that they both confronted it and they and both accepted at least from when i spoke with um McCoy about it he 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 understood how, he understood this and how people live with it is um uh, we we can't I mean I can't know exactly I will say that 
uh, Hashimoto's granddaughter uh, has attended with her family the reunions of the survivor, Indianapolis survivors um, for a long time. And so she's welcome within the group, which is really, really, when you step back and look at it and you think of the strife and the conflict going on in the world, you just wonder in 50 years, in 75 years, will we ever have at our reunions of, Af of, of Afghanistan vets or uh, will we have um, t Taliban at the reunions? I mean, to put it in a very blunt, not a very um, nuanced way to put it, but I mean, so perhaps that acceptance by the Hashimoto family and et cetera, et cetera is part of that modernization of Japan, um, if I understand the question correctly. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because because you're, you're pointing out both, uh, on one extent, the modernization, uh, you know, fueled a lot of economic competition uh, to the United States, which took a lot of jobs and wealth away from the country. Uh, it fueled a, uh, a formidable, potentially a formidable opponent uh, on the world stage, but it also fostered the ability for Hashimoto's granddaughter to probably fly at a reasonable rate and uh, to the United States and attend a reunion uh, and build relationships well, with these people. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> she is living in the States. Oh, even more incredible. Yeah, I know with, with her family. So uh, I, I want to make sure we cover some other important uh, topics uh, while we have you. Uh, and, and I want to go back to the book 12 Strong. Now, I mean, first off, what is it like to have a, a Hollywood blockbuster movie star uh, be the main in your Chris Helmsworth is the lead in your book on 12 Strong? Like, that's incredible. What went through your head when you saw that he was going to play the lead? <laughs> when Thor was going to be the lead. Um, <laughs> when Thor was going to be the lead in your body. You know, it, it's funny, you know, um, I was able to go on the set and I'd worked with and talked with um, Bruckheimer and his company for a long time. It takes a long time to make a movie and I just, I, you don't bank on any of it. Um, but it was a challenge, which I think they really delivered on because this book, is not a book about, um, it's not a Rambo book and it's not a seal book. It's a very, and we, we can talk about what it is, but, um, it was not, it was an incredible experience to be on the set and watch Michael Shannon, um, you know, say some of the lines I'd written, which were lifted directly, um, into the script. Um, does that answer the question? I mean, it, I, I, I'm, <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of, you know, regime is kind of like watching glaciers form. So it's, while it's incredibly exciting, by the time it actually happens, you're like, oh yeah, this happened or this is happening. <laughs> or, I'm, you, I'm, I'm, it, it seems normal now. And in fact, it really is not normal. Um, yeah. Having your book getting picked up by Jerry Bruckheimer and having Thor play your lead. Yeah. That ain't normal. <laughs> That's right. pretty impressive. Uh, and so I, I guess, you know, when you coalesce your lessons from In Harm's Way, from 12 Strong, and you go into this Memorial Day weekend, I'm curious, what thoughts do you have on, on days like Memorial Day in particular, where we're supposed to, I mean, let's face it, everybody's going to be out barbecuing, going out on the lake, you know, having a wonderful weekend and enjoying some free time, uh, absolutely well deserved. But what do you think we should be reflecting on sure. in our private moments this weekend? I, I, I tell you one story um, It's just about in harm's way. When we talked about we're floating in the water, you and I, and we've been together now for a long time. And um, we realize that we're probably not going to be rescued. I won't pick one of us, but just one of us says to the other, um, I'm done. I'm out of here. And we, one of us swims away into the oblivion and we either disappear from exhaustion, shark attack. It's just hard to say. Um, and we're left behind and okay, I'll just pick me. I'm, I'm thinking Rajiv just left. I'm going to too. And at that moment, as Dick Phelan told me again from Lansing, Michigan, he heard uh, his father's voice. Other men around the country as we went on a book tour heard a voice too. It wasn't the trumpet of angels or et cetera. It was just simple stuff like, Hey, uh, Dick Phelan, uh, finish your homework, uh, Ed Brown, do your, you know, mow the grass, 
really pedestrian banal moments when um, these young men felt identified or, or, or reminded of who they were. Mm -hmm. And that simple gesture comes from a teacher too, or a coach allowed them to hang in there. So really in the end, as we think, as we go about this weekend or, or how the book changed me, um, was to think what kind of citizen are we or neighbor are we? Cause we never know in the middle of a day as we go about our business, what we might look, do, donate, do for, create, um, for someone else that in a moment of their existential crisis, and we all have them, uh, they might grab onto and remember. Yeah. So this is why I think this story resonates. And, um, cause again, ultimately it's about just that. And, um, uh, well, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, we have about, you know, five, five to 10 minutes left. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about a project that I didn't actually discover until I was uh, preparing for our interview today, which is the National Writer Series, uh, which I believe you are, are uh, the founder of and, and incredibly active in. Can you talk to us about the National Writer Series, what it is and uh, your, your goals sure. for this program? It's it came after uh, Horse Soldiers allowed us um allowed me some time and I, um, growing up as I have in the upper Midwest, um, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to go to a place called Interlochen Arts Academy for a high school year of creative writing. And I'm smiling because it was better than my first couple of years of college. I mean, it was a no kidding. We're treating you like an artist. We're bringing in artists from around the country, the world, and you're going to learn a craft. And for a kid like me, who is a nerd without direction, um, <laughs> it was a godsend. But we ran out of money and worked hard. I got a job at a restaurant for a year and saved money and got to go back to Interlochen. But what helped me over the edge of that was a, a local benefactor gave me $1,000 to apply to the tuition. And I mean, I knew early on I wanted to be a writer and this and this just changed the course of my life. Um, so the writer series is born out of the sense of my community that we're going to bring the world here and hopefully enrich the lives of others, especially young writers. So we have a scholarship program and a, and a program called Front Street Writers, which is when I learned how expensive it was now to get a, a private education in, in, in something like creative writing, which is a pencil and a piece of paper, we began to put the main stage authors that come to Traverse City, Michigan on the City Opera House stage into the classroom. So created a, a creative writing curriculum, hired a, 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 a writer in residence from around the country. Basically, I'm recreating the Interlock and Arts Academy model that I had as a kid, but we're going to give it back for free to our local community. And we've just had an amazing time. We have 250 authors, Lee Child, George Packer, Margaret Atwood, Jody P. Cole, Sebastian Younger, Carl Malantes, Phil Caputo, Anna Quinlan. I mean, it goes on and just, it started out using my Rolodex and my agent. Would you, you know, you know the feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Would you come and talk to me? Would you come tell me your story? And uh, doing an interview on stage that's half lit in the dark, with 600 people listening is really like having a conversation on a train late at night going through a foreign country. I mean, I just find it really hypnotic and often it, luckily for my living as a journalist, I've been able to have those and then take them and turn them into stories of some kind. But that's what the writer series does. It tries to put a, a, a book in people's hands on main street and um, enrich the lives of, of, of young authors. Well, I am absolutely thrilled uh, for your work. And in many ways, uh, I, I love that analogy. The, it's like having a conversation in the dark, with a mid-lit room and 600 people. It's like having a conversation on a train in a foreign country late at night. What a beautiful yeah. uh, image. Yeah, um, it's, it's, <laughs> well, you, know, you know, it feels like that, right? Sometimes you, when you get into the groove and you're, um, and, uh, you're, you're in it, those discoveries. Yeah. 
I'm curious as you mentor your authors, like let's say you're talking uh, to uh, nonfiction authors uh, in, in an upcoming generation. What are some of the investigative journalism questions that you believe merit the kind of storytelling that you have brought to the Indianapolis and uh, to Afghanistan? What are some of the questions that you wish you could go and answer? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know if they're investigative so much, although that will uh, that emerges in the narrative. For instance, the court martial. When you investigate the court martial, was it just? Was it et cetera? And it turns out, I many conclude no, it was not just. Mm -hmm. But in the in, but to get there, it's tell you know just sit, sitting down at the kitchen table, as with horse soldiers, for instance. And when I was talking with Mike Elmore from Chicago, a weapons guy on one of the special forces team, first people into Afghanistan. I mean, literally, there's tw Mike and 12 and 11 other buddies on, on the SF team linking up with uh, with uh, Afghan indigenous fighters who've been fighting the Taliban. And I, he goes, I can't tell you about, I can't tell you how much the, you know, how much the, the batteries for the radio weighed. And I'm like, Mike, what? He goes, yeah, that's classified. And if I tell you how much they weigh, then the enemy will know what our logistics train is to carry enough calories to haul that much weight. I'm thinking, Mike, you're thinking way beyond me. <laughs> All I want to know is what did you do when you were sitting in the cave, you know, looking at the Taliban line and um, you're lining up and the, you're, 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 your in-country, your indigenous partners are, are planning to attack that line. He goes, oh, well, uh, I was drawing um, album covers from the 1970s in my notebook, like Led Zeppelin, like Black Zeppelin. He goes, yeah, he goes, Mike, that's the detail right there. By asking the question about how we are more like each other, um, I did a lot of Hollywood profiles for Esquire and Men's Journal, you know, Clooney and Harrison Ford. And, and my, my approach was always, Okay, I, you know you're a movie star. We all know you're a movie star, but what do you do? I mean, what what do you do when no one's looking? You know how, not how are you extraordinary? But we'll get there. But what do we have in common? And I would say to young, the the best thing they can learn is just to listen. Just to listen. Like, what are, yeah. Where are you? You know, I mean, how did? I'll tell you, I don't know how much time we have, but I, the, the stupid question is so powerful. I'm going to end with this. I, the first time I went to Kentucky, home of 5th Special Forces Group, U.S. Army, and this is the group that goes into Afghanistan in 2001 and is featured in um, Horse Soldiers. Um, uh, Sc uh, Scotty Brower, who became a general, kept saying, Doug, well, maybe you want to talk to ODA 595. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I'm nodding like, yeah. And maybe there's an ODA... Uh, you know, seven five two, and there's ODA, and I, finally I just said, and there's a, and by this time, all the guys have kind of filed down the into the room, they're leaning against the the filing cabinets, and just kind of checking me out because they hadn't cooperated in a book in fifty years. Right, they're the quiet professionals. These are not the Navy SEALs who are always <laughs> <laughs> pushing out books, and uh, not no disrespect to the SEALs, I guess, but um, and I said, Scott, what's an ODA? And the whole room like drops, like. Uh, what you don't know? And I said, no, I gotta say, I just don't know an ODA because I didn't. Yeah, I've done a lot of an, an, an operational detachment alpha for uh, it's a exactly. special force and so for those you can, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I and you could feel that's what they said, but you could just feel the whole energy in the room change. That guys are actually like they're like leaning in, thinking, oh, what a poor sap, he doesn't even know what an ODA is. How dangerous can he be? We really need to help him here if he wants to tell this story. So the dumb question uh, actually told him I was being honest and upfront. And it actually um, prompted him, as I just said, to think, well, um, we better lean in. We lean forward here and see if we can help this guy out um, because he seems to be asking simple questions. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, man, that was funny. It was so well, funny. I, I tell you what, I'm glad uh, that you had the 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 strength of character to ask <laughs> what uh, you, you have described as a dumb question. But quite frankly, I think that it's actually, like you said, it's the this the fundamentals, the simple things. You know, uh, what are you doing when no one is looking? Those kinds of 
simple questions can actually be so important in shaping a narrative. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I truly respect that. It's actually, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is how I learn more about history from fiction these days than nonfiction. Mm. Uh, historical fiction, because a someone writing historical fiction, they're they're doing their best to paint a scene accurately of what life was like in that day and age. But they're able to speculate about things that a nonfiction author can't, like someone's yeah. state of mind, their emotional presence, their things that a you know, if you're reading a tried and true biography or something like that, you're not gonna see a ton of uh, you know, sort of crafting of the emotional narrative. Right. That's not what that book is. That's designed right. to do. Um, and I think in that journey, I've kind of understood that those like nuances actually are what make because whether we like it or not, decisions are are very rooted in our emotional being. So I really like that. You know, listen, ask the, the simple. Let's call it the simple question. Maybe not the stupid. The simple question. Yeah, the dumb. <laughs> um, and you never know where it's going to end up. I mean, I didn't you I know. Um... I didn't intend to write horse soldiers after um, in arm's way, but I, but I thought it would be a simple little project in the modern soldier. Yeah. And it took, me, took me down the road and, and we, my editor, I have to just, as we close out here, I have to credit him because he created the name horse soldiers. Um, they didn't, and now it's become kind of a term of art. If you like read a news, Oh, um, Joe Smith, it was a horse soldiers. Nephew. And it's kind of fascinating to think how that just came over a phone call with Colin Harrison and Scribner. Um, the, the statue in the 9-11 Memorial Park in New York City is nicknamed the Horse Soldier Statue. And um, so it's beautiful. It's, so why did we change the name to 12 Strong? What was that's a good identity? question? And I, um, so there is another edition of Horse Soldiers Out called 12 Strong. Um, the movie studio just felt that 12 Strong resonated better with people. And it may or may not. I prefer <laughs> I prefer horse soldiers. Um, uh, As do I, if I can be completely honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, all these books, women have been some of the largest groups of readers. And a lot of times, they'll, you know, they'll buy it, especially my Vietnam book, The Odyssey of Echo Company. They're buying it to um, get entree into a, a male relative's experience, a grandfather or uncle who may have been in, 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 in Vietnam or World War II or Afghanistan. And I think, I, quite honest, I think when the movie studio tested this title, um, 12 Strong resonated more with women. Wow. So that, okay. That's, that, that's the way it works, but that's, that's, that's their job, not mine, you know. <laughs> that's somebody. That's how somebody else pays the bills. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, Doug, uh, you have been an author that has shaped my worldview from a very early age uh, and a very formative wow. and vulnerable time in my life. Uh, so I want to thank you for making time uh, to reach out to me. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, to, 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 I want to thank you for making time for, for 99 Pages. And actually, uh, you know, as we sign off here, I, I wrote you an email uh when i was a lieutenant uh coming you back did? from afghanistan i did and you responded and that's actually and it's a I, not a, a facebook message and you responded you're like thanks for the compliments it's great to have it's great to have oh, man. I'll send you, <laughs> and, and uh i i knew uh when i reached out to you to come on to 99 pages some 15 years later uh that i, I had a feeling in my heart that we were going to be able to get you on so it's, it's really excited to have you out here i'm happy for you congrats on what you're doing it's, Thank you, you know, very much. It, yeah, it's a lot of work, and but I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to sit here and talk with you. So let's we'll do it again. You write a book, um, you come to the National Writers Series. <laughs> you betcha, you betcha. All right, thanks everybody.